It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well. As usual, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll let us know. Please get in touch using the phone number, the church phone. We can accept calls and text on that. That's 608-224-0274. Or if you have email access, that would be great as well. My email, the church email, is fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And we'd love to hear from you. If there's anything that we need to be praying about. If there's any way that we can help you, we hope that you'll give us a call or send a message. As of right now, we are still planning on getting together for worship this coming Lord's Day morning at 9 a.m. and also at 10.30 a.m. Most people this past Lord's Day came together at the 9 o'clock service, and so we actually did a little experiment at 10.30. We tried replaying the 9 a.m. service on the projector at 10.30, and so we projected up front everything that happened at 9 a.m. And so I guess it was a little bit of a rerun, but that is the service that we also uh, put out there on YouTube, the one that we streamed on YouTube at 1030, and that seemed to work pretty well. Unfortunately, we also uh, had some trouble with the phone line this past week. That happens from time to time. As with any technology, there are issues every once in a while. It got a little choppy after 10 minutes or so and then dropped out completely. But we did get the phone up and running maybe an hour or so later. And when I say that we got the phone up and running, uh, that is not me. Uh, Somebody much more skilled than I am at that is the one who got the phone up and running. But uh, that got up and running and repeated over and over again until tonight, as we have done since about March. But if you can join us on Sunday, please be sure to sign up online using the Sign Up Genius account. Uh, Please also remember that we'll be keeping the doors and the windows open. It was breezy in there this past Sunday. If you were there, you know that we uh, came to worship during a high wind advisory, and uh, we were advised. It was very windy in there, but uh, good ventilation, we might say. Uh, Wind whistling through some of the windows, but we survived. It went very well as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Please also to remember to bring your own supplies for the Lord's Supper, if at all possible. We're trying to limit the things that we touch when we're there together in the building as best as we can. And that is certainly one way of doing that. Tonight we continue with our pause in studying the book of Luke. We'll get back to Luke in a little bit, but we're studying a series of worksheets. And for several weeks now, we've been looking at some tools for studying the Bible with others. We know that we need to be teaching people the gospel. We need to be teaching the Bible. We need to be telling people about Jesus. But often one of the first objections to teaching is that we don't know what to teach. We don't know what to say. And so over the past several weeks, we've been looking at some guides, some study guides, some worksheets that we might be able to use when it comes to teaching the Bible to others. Several weeks ago then, we looked at the Learn From Me worksheet, basically a series of scriptures introducing people to Jesus. And the idea is Jesus has offered us a place in his yoke. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and all that. But before we take on that yoke, We need to know who it is who's offering us a place in his yoke. And so we need to learn more about Jesus. We need to know who he is. And so we work through those passages introducing us to the Lord. Uh, We then looked at the worksheet, What Do the Scriptures Teach? And this one was intended to uh, help those who seem to think that baptism can't be necessary because baptism is a work. That's a common belief out there in the religious world and has been for many years. Baptism is a work. We can't be saved by works. Therefore, baptism can't save us. That's the idea that many have. And so we have that, and we had that long list of things that save us. And we, of course, invite the person that we're studying with to work their way through that. Check the boxes you think are appropriate. And then we come back together, we study, we work our way through that uh, item by item, and we learned that a number of things are described as saving us in Scripture. We don't get to choose between them. We can't say, I'll take 1, 3, 5, and 9 and skip the rest. We're not able to do that. But rather, we have to take everything the Bible teaches on the subject of salvation. And then, of course, at the end, we came to 1 Peter 3.21, where baptism is described as saving us. Just outright statement, baptism now saves you. Of course, along with faith and grace and the life of Christ and truth and so on. Last week we looked at worship. Uh, A lot of times when we talk to people about the Bible, they want to know, what do you people do when you get together? How is it different from a church as I experienced it in the past? And so this worksheet guides us through some of the major aspects of worship. The Lord's Supper and singing and prayer and giving 
and the preaching of the Word of God and those passages that go along supporting those various acts of worship. Tonight I want us to go back to the plan of salvation, but I want us to focus tonight very specifically on the act of baptism. And we have a sheet to study together. Uh, we looked at baptism, of course, at the end of that long list a few weeks ago, so we just very briefly uh, covered it almost in passing as we wrapped up class a few weeks ago, but sometimes we really need to dig in. And so if somebody wants to know more, this is certainly one way of, of doing that. I've tried to put a link to this worksheet in the description under the YouTube video, so if you don't have it in front of you now, you can maybe go to the description and find the link there. It's on the church website, fourlakescoc.org. It's under the Grow tab, and then under the Articles tab, or a little click box under that. So I think I've also put it in the comments under the link to tonight's video in the Facebook group, and I've also mailed it, an actual hard copy, made out of a dead tree, actual real paper. I've sent that by mail to those of you, at least most of you who join us on the phone every week, those of you who get the bulletin in that way anyway. And so hopefully you have it either today in the mail, if not, hopefully in the next day or two if you don't. If you do not have this worksheet tonight and you are not able to get it online, please give me a call and I would be glad to mail you a hard copy or get it to you in some other way. But we'll be studying this at least tonight and next week, uh, perhaps even another week after that, depending on how far we get next Wednesday. But it would be very helpful if you could have this out in front of you on paper, if at all possible. God's plan of salvation is awesome. It is profound, and it's fairly simple, fairly straightforward at the same time. It, most people can understand it. However, as we have often discussed in the past, many times people have had help misunderstanding God's plan of salvation, and that is so unfortunate. And often those misunderstandings come down to the purpose of baptism, and specifically to the placement of baptism in the salvation process. Where does it go in the salvation timeline? Many people in the religious world teach that we're baptized as babies, and so at that point, when we're first born, we are saved from the sin we've inherited from Adam at that point, when we're baptized as infants. Then we come to believe roughly 12 or 13 years later, the confirmation process, as many religious groups today would describe it. And so that's one way uh, that people have had help misunderstanding God's plan of salvation, that we're born we're baptized shortly after birth, we're forgiven of sin, and then years later we come to believe. That's one misunderstanding. Many others in the religious world teach that we're saved immediately when we believe in Jesus, whenever that is. We accept him into our hearts as our personal Savior, maybe by praying a prayer, uh, maybe by signing on some kind of certificate. I've seen it in the back of some Bibles where do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he has saved you? If so, sign here, and then you're good to go. And so it's something along those lines. And then maybe after that, they might say, you should probably also get baptized joining the church of your choice. And I think many of us who've studied the Bible with people have come across that a time or two, many times probably. And so that is another example of how many people in the religious world have had help misunderstanding the plan of salvation. And so you're saved when you believe, and then the church maybe has some kind of a mass baptism uh, several months later, maybe quarterly, maybe once a year, something like that. that that's another major uh, misunderstanding. Well, most of us understand, though, that babies don't have sin. We are not born with inherited sin. We are not guilty of the sin of Adam. Adam's sin, yes, it had consequences in the world, but we're not guilty of it personally. And so babies don't even need to be baptized. Jesus told us to be like children, didn't he? He, he wasn't telling us to be like sinful little creatures. He was telling us to have the innocence of children. Uh, and we understand, though, that as we mature, as we grow older, we sin. We get to a point in life where we understand what's right and wrong, and we choose to do wrong. And so we're lost. And then at some point, hopefully, we hear the gospel. We believe it. We turn away from sin. We allow ourselves to be immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And we're saved at the point of baptism. 
here's where it gets complicated though many times people will start worshiping with us maybe they have a friend or a loved one who's a member of the congregation they might attend for a number of months even years and over time they hear what we teach on baptism and it's very easy for them to start projecting what they hear back on what they did many years ago and so over time they start to think what these people are saying is what I have actually done when that is really not the case and there's no dishonesty there that's just the way that it sometimes happen but it is critically important that we have a proper understanding of baptism not just now looking back on it but it's important that we understood what we were doing when we actually did it and the reason is baptism is not some kind of magic act it's not some kind of magic potion there's not some special formula there but instead we play a role in it by understanding what we were doing when we did it it's not just getting dunked in water it's more than that it's a matter of understanding why we were dipped or immersed under the water the deed cannot be separated from the faith or the understanding that we have at the time and so before we really dig into what baptism really is it's important to establish what the person we are studying with truly understood at the time of his or her baptism and over time I've learned that it's important to write it down and this helps to avoid what I've just warned about projecting what I know now back on what I did way back when so this is why we have these questions up here at the top of the worksheet up at the beginning and not at the end you know it, it wouldn't make sense to study everything the Bible teaches and then say oh by the way what did you do but it's better because of this danger to get down on paper what we actually did and then with an open heart and an open Bible compare what we've done with what the Bible actually teaches so this is why we have these questions at the beginning not at the end and again this class tonight is probably not primarily for our benefit tonight it might be and that's great if you have not obeyed the gospel or if you're somewhat confused or want to know more we are glad that you're with us but that's not our primary goal that's not our main mission tonight uh, our goal tonight as Christians is to get familiar with this study guide as a resource so we can turn around and go out and use it with others um, so let's go through it and go through these first questions starting with number one in your experience have you ever made a commitment to Christ yes or no and if yes at what age and again as we study it's important um, that the one we're studying with goes first here uh, I don't want to put my answer down and then show them and say so is this what you did yes or no no I want them to go through this I want them to honestly answer to the best of their ability if if they don't know then they don't know and that's all right we'll get back to that at at the end now for me if I'm answering this question and I will answer it along with the person that I'm studying with uh, but when I look at question number one yes I can say yes to the first question I did make a commitment to Christ at some point in my life I first made that commitment when I was 11 years old almost 12 and I remember it well it was on March 18th 1984 and um, if somebody says no that's pretty much as far as we go as far as this worksheet is concerned we might want to go to a different uh, different worksheet a different direction because that's not really the purpose here remember this is aimed at those who have some history with baptism who might have some misunderstanding about it so my answer here on number one is yes at 11 years old your answer might be different question number two is at the time that is at the time of that commitment did you make a confession yes or no and if yes what was that confession and again we want them to answer this is not us answering for them we're not guiding them through it we're not giving them hints we're not suggesting we're not leading in a certain direction uh, but when I fill this out on my own across the table personally I can say yes here when I made a commitment to follow Jesus I also made the good confession I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God be aware though that many have confessed something along the lines of I believe that God for Christ's sake has forgiven my sins or something like that and that's critical we need to get that down on paper we need to understand that but whatever they confessed 
at the time of their commitment, it's important for them on their own to write that down. The same goes for number three. Have you been baptized? Yes or no? If yes, describe the action. In other words, what happened? When you were baptized, what did that look like? Did a priest pour water over your forehead, over a basin in front of the church when you were about a week old? Were you immersed as an adult? Were you dunked completely under the water? Did somebody sprinkle water on you? And I look at this question and personally, yes, I have been baptized. And again, it was also on March 18th, 1984, my dad immersed me in water. I'll tell you, it was cold. I had just helped clean and repaint the baptistry the week before. And so as an 11 year old, I was out, I was doing the scrubbing and the paint removal and the scraping and the etching with the hydrochloric acid or whatever it was. And probably that contributed to me being baptized. I probably did a whole lot of thinking about baptism that week as I was cleaning and helping to repaint the baptistry. And so anyway, as I remember back in March 1984, we had just cleaned it, repainted it, filled it up with fresh water. It was 54 degrees as I remember it. It literally took my breath away. I came up out of the water gasping almost. It was uh, so incredibly cold. Now, the people we're studying with, they don't need to know the temperature of the water they were baptized in. I think you understand what I'm saying there. Uh, but, but if you were baptized, what did it look like? Describe the action. Was it sprinkling, pouring, immersion, or so on? Uh, with number five, if you have been baptized, for what purpose were you baptized? And again, we don't want to go first and have the person say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I did too. That's not the goal here. Uh, but we want them to honestly answer without any prodding from us. Uh, if they don't remember, I've sometimes encouraged them to call the person who did it or call the church where they were baptized. If they say, I was baptized at such and such a church out in, you know, California, but I can't really remember why, um, I've encouraged them, give that church a call. We'll call them right now. We'll look them up online. I'll help you out here. We'll, we'll call the minister or whoever's there now, and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of this. Why does your church baptize people? And, um, and most of the people will answer, you know, this is why we baptize here at this church, and they'll explain. Um, now, I can certainly do my own research. I can look that all up on my own, but it, it often means more if it comes directly from the person um, who was baptized in that way at that religious group. Uh, finally, with number six, were you saved before baptism or at baptism? And again, we want them to answer this. Our goal is not to win an argument here. We're not beating people over the head. We're not twisting arms. Our goal is for this person we're studying with to be saved. Uh, we don't just want them to agree with us. We don't want to say baptism is for this reason in this way. Uh, this is what you did, right? Uh, we're not leading them in that way, but we want them to truly understand what they have done before we go to the scriptures, and then we want to make that comparison. Uh, if there's some confusion, uh, sometimes I'll have the person make a timeline. Whip out a paper and pencil. Uh, we've used a whiteboard in a classroom downstairs at the church building before, and I'll actually have them draw a line, draw a timeline, and I'll ask them to put it all in order. You know, at what point on this line were you saved? At what point on this line did you confess? And what did you confess? At what point on this line were you baptized? And put those in the order that you understood those to be in uh, when you did what you did in the past. Uh, often then I'll have somebody answer these questions and just put it out there on paper. And, th and then I'll say, um, now I'd like to, to show you how I was saved. Is that all right? You know, you've showed me how you were saved. Is, let me show you what my timeline looks like. And then I'll say, these are my answers. And then we'll go through my numbers one through six. And then once it's all written down, then we open the word of God and then we move on from there. Okay, right under the questions, you'll notice that we have this little paragraph. The following chart contains all New Testament passages mentioning baptism after the resurrection of Jesus that refer to Jesus' baptism in water. In the following chart, put an X where nothing is said about the concept in a particular passage. Otherwise, summarize the idea in a few words. So we're getting ready to really dig in here, and it's an interesting study, at least to me. And so this explains what we'll be doing. This is where we're going with this. We'll just be going through the New Testament in order, 
looking at all the references to water baptism. We won't be looking at John's baptism. Remember, John the Baptist had his own baptism. We're not going to get bogged down with that. We're not going there. We can't be here for days and weeks at a time, so we're, we're leaving that out. We won't be looking at the baptism of fire. Remember, John referred to one coming after him, you know, baptized in fire. We're not going there. We won't be focusing on Holy Spirit baptism. We will mention that a time or two here because there are some similarities, but there are some differences. By the way, as I understand it, Holy Spirit baptism only happened twice to the apostles on the day of Pentecost in Acts 1 and also to Cornelius, actually before he was saved in Acts 10. That's when they got the miraculous ability to speak in tongues and all that. But we're not dealing with that. For the purpose of our study on this worksheet, we're looking at Jesus' baptism in water, and we're trying to learn something from each one of these references. So we're just going to go down the line looking at all of these passages. As you can see here with each passage, for the purpose of our the PowerPoint or what's on the screen here, we're focusing on one passage at a time. There's no way for us to get that whole worksheet <laughs> on a 4-3 ratio PowerPoint and be able to read it. So I, I've put the blank, uh, the heading on the chart up at the top with the blanks one at a time, one line at a time. And then I'll put the scripture there in the middle. Then I'll leave the graphic and the tiny thumbnail of the chart down in the bottom right-hand corner just to remind us that we're doing part of a larger study here, working our way through something larger. So our first reference to baptism after Jesus' resurrection comes in Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. This is what we usually refer to as being the Great Commission. After Jesus' resurrection, and just a few days before his ascension back into heaven, he assembles the apostles together, and this is what he tells them. This is their mission. He is commissioning them. This is what they need to be doing. This is what you need to do for the rest of your time on this earth. Notice this is where we come to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So let's just see how this works. Does this passage give any indication as to the age of those who are to be baptized? And again, remember, we are not giving the answers here, but we're showing the person we're studying with the passage. We're allowing them to read it, and we're allowing them to come to a conclusion on their own. So I would notice that it doesn't say when they are 12 years old does it? We don't have age in terms of an actual number, the year of your birth. It doesn't say when they turn into adults at the age of 18 or 21 or, or whatever, none of that. So we're not given an actual age in that sense. But notice, do we have something here? In verse 19, Jesus says that his disciples or his apostles are to make disciples of all the nations. We may need to look that up a little bit, but what is a disciple? A disciple is a student. A disciple is a learner. And so although an exact age is not given, do we get some clue as to how old people need to be before they're baptized? Well, they need to be old enough to be students, don't they? They must be old enough to be learners. They have to be old enough to understand what's going on. In other words, we're not talking about little babies in this passage. We're not talking about little kids one week old. And so in the blank under age... If it's up to me, I would write something to the effect of old enough to be students, old enough to be disciples or followers of the Lord. Moving over to action, as to the action, whether this is sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, we don't really have anything here. Obviously, we could look up the word baptize, and we could learn that it refers to dipping or immersing underwater. But just based on the context, without a knowledge of the Greek language, we really don't have anything here. So I would just put an X under action. As to the when, again, we don't really have anything to explain the timing of this, so I would put an X there as well. As to the purpose, it's not explicitly stated, but it's in some way tied to making disciples, isn't it? And so personally, I write in here, tied to making disciples. Disciples are in some way made in the act of baptism. So it's not rock solid filling in that blank, but it, it at least seems that there is some clue 
uh, as to the purpose of it, that baptism is in some way tied to making disciples. Uh, as to whether baptism is essential to salvation, we could probably make that argument here, but it's not explicitly stated, so I normally just put an X here. Uh, in other, as to what we learn about baptism in this passage, anything else that's not covered in these other uh, boxes, uh, I usually try to note that it's done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, we look at other passages. This is not some kind of magic phrase that is said over a person, but it's just the reminder that baptism is done with God's authority. A stop in the name of the law kind of statement. It doesn't always have to be explicitly stated, but it is very helpful when it is. And I try to always mention this whenever I baptize somebody. We're doing this by God's authority with his permission in his name. Um, as with stop in the name of the law, I don't think the police always say that. I think that's a movie kind of thing, don't you? But the idea is there. When cops give an order, they usually explain who they are. Stop, police, drop whatever it is or, or whatever you're doing. Um, some of you know the first time I ever went to the range with a handgun of my own, I was all alone for the first few minutes uh, down at the public range at Yellowstone Lake State Park. And I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm, I'm on my own here. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and I was thankful to be alone until the entire, I think it was Belleville, Belleville uh, Police Department showed up in several SUVs for their annual certification. I'm like, oh, no, I got, I got company, not just company. I got a lot of company, and they're all cops, and, and I don't know what I'm doing. And so as they walked up to the, the shooting line, I, I told them, I said, uh, guys, I have no idea what I'm doing. And they said, that's okay, we don't either. <laughs> and with all of their gear and weaponry, uh, nobody brought a staple gun. And so they came over and they asked to borrow mine. I did not refuse. I let the cops use my staple gun to get their targets on the backstop. And, uh, and they said, you will never have any trouble, sir, when you pass through Bellevue <laughs> and our Belleville. And then they spent the rest of the morning yelling at targets and blasting away. Stop, police, drop your weapons. I mean, over and over. That's, that's what they did the whole morning. And my point is there, we understand what it means to command that somebody do something by someone else's authority. When the police say drop a weapon, they're not doing that on their own authority. They represent the law as a whole. And that's what's going on here in Matthew 28. When we baptized, when we baptize people, we're doing it not just because we think it's important. We didn't make this up. But we're baptizing people because God said that this is what needs to happen. And so when we baptize people, we do it in the name of or by the authority of God's name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's just one comment that we can put there under other. Um, and this is what I often write in these blanks. I'm just putting it on the screen very briefly. I couldn't get it to go up one by one or else I would have done that. I could have, but this would have multiplied this uh, presentation to over 100 slides. I really didn't want to go in that direction. But in summary, those who are baptized are old enough to be students. Baptism is tied to making disciples, and it's done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is by God's authority. Next passage is Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, which is basically just Mark's account of what we just looked at in Matthew. So just a slightly different wording. It was the same occasion, just a different guy writing it down. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so again, we go through this with the person we're studying with, and we allow them to do this. We are not just giving them the answers here, but we want them to learn from the scriptures themselves. As to what I usually observe here, uh, what do we learn about the age of the person being baptized? Well, in verse 16, we find the person is old enough to believe, right? Person's old enough to believe. So again, we don't have an exact age. This isn't 12. This isn't 18 or 21 or 35. Um... But we do know that they must be old enough to believe. As to the action, we don't have any real indication from the context as to whether this is sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, other than the definition of the word, which we're not digging into here. As to the when or the timing, the timeline of this, we find here that belief comes before baptism, and that baptism is then followed by salvation. Again, there are millions in the religious world who have basically reworded this verse to say, 
he who has been baptized and is saved will believe 12 years later. Right? That's what many people wish this verse said. That's infant baptism. He who has been baptized is saved and will believe 12 years later. But that's not what this verse actually says, does it? Others would like to rephrase this verse to say, He who has believed has been saved and will be baptized to join a church at some point in the future. That's what those who advocate the sinner's prayer would like for this verse to say. He who has believed has been saved and will be baptized at some point in the future. But again, that's not what this verse says, does it? Instead, it says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And so as to the when, there is an order here. Belief, baptism, salvation. As to the purpose of baptism, it seems pretty clear that the purpose is salvation. And then also, of course, as to the answer, uh, to answer the question essential to salvation, yes, baptism is essential to salvation. It comes before salvation. Uh, some have objected to this by saying that the condemnation in this passage is only promised to those who don't believe, not to those who aren't baptized. In other words, in their minds, this verse really needs to say, but he who has disbelieved and has not been baptized shall be condemned. And so they try to make a big deal out of that, that it doesn't say that. However, I would point out that based on everything we know about baptism, that statement really is not necessary. In other words, if somebody does not believe, if, if somebody does not believe, is that person going to be baptized? That'd be rather redundant, um, as, as I understand it. And, and I would illustrate it in this way. If I say to one of my kids, uh, please go to pick and save and buy ketchup and I'll give you $10. But if you don't go to pick and save, I will not give you the $10. That's a simple illustration. And they would understand that. They would understand what I'm saying. I do not need to say, go to pick and save and buy ketchup and I will give you $10. But if you do not go to pick and save and do not buy ketchup, I will not give you $10. Obviously, if they refuse to go to pick and save at all, they're not going to be buying ketchup at pick and save. And, and I would say that we could use an illustration like this uh, with reference to what goes on here. So we can't use the wording at the end of verse 16 to in some way invalidate uh, what Jesus said in the first part of verse 16. Uh, so under other, I might say unbelief equals condemnation. Unbelief equals condemnation. If we refuse to believe the Lord, baptism is the least of our worries. If we refuse to believe the Lord, we're not ever going to be baptized. We are condemned, and we could illustrate it in other ways. If you go to the pharmacy and take the pill, you will get better. But if you do not go to the pharmacy, you will not get better. Does that make sense? We don't need to add, and if you do not take the pill, because if you don't go to the pharmacy, the pill isn't going to be a factor there. But those are some illustrations that we might be able to use uh, as we work our way through this. And that's what it looks like to me here. Baptism is for those who are old enough to believe, it comes after belief, so belief, baptism, then salvation. We're baptized for the purpose of being saved, so yes, it is essential. And uh, if we don't, then we will be condemned. Let's move on to the next one here. We cross over into the book of Acts. And this happens just a week or two after what Jesus just said in the previous two passages. So Peter and the others, they stand up to speak to this huge crowd around the temple, assembled there on the day of Pentecost. They preach the message that Jesus had just told them to preach. So they are fulfilling the command. When he said, go preach the gospel to the whole world, they're starting it right now. We don't have time to read all of Acts 2. If we were one-on-one -on -one across the table, we could. But I'll just summarize. Peter and the others stand up and they basically tell the crowd, you people murdered Jesus. You people kill the Son of God. And that brings us to Acts 2, 37 through 42. Acts 2, 37 through 42. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. 
And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. As to the age, how old are these people? Well, based on the context, these are people who are old enough to feel guilty, aren't they? These are people who are old enough to repent of sin, to change their ways. And so we're not talking about little babies. We're not talking about little children here or those who are not yet accountable to the gospel. Remember, the message is, you people murdered Jesus. You don't say that to little babies. But So he's talking to adults here. He's talking to people who are old enough to understand this. We have nothing concerning the action, sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. That's not addressed here. But when were they baptized? Notice in verse 41, they were baptized that day, weren't they? So this isn't something they put off. This isn't come back at Christmas and get baptized in our big baptism service or, you know, next year, nothing like that. But they were baptized that very day. Once they understood what they needed to do, they did it. And they didn't put it off. As to the purpose... It's very clear here. They were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. This wasn't to show that they had already been saved, but they were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And as we've learned in another recent study, this is pretty much the same phrase Jesus uses as he institutes the Lord's Supper back in Matthew 26, where he refers to his blood that is to be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood was poured out. It was shed on the cross not because sins had already been forgiven. He didn't die on the cross because people had already been forgiven. His blood was poured out in order to accomplish or to make the forgiveness of sins happen. And that's the same concept here. And we'll get back to this toward the end. Uh, but our understanding of baptism is critical or else it's not really bad, baptism. If I'm baptized thinking that I'm already saved at the point of my baptism... That's not biblical baptism. That's not what these people submitted to at this point. Uh, back to our chart, baptism is essential to salvation. Uh, yes, it is. We are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And without baptism, our sins are not forgiven. And so, yes, baptism is essential. Uh, in the other column, I would just observe that those who are baptized are told that they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, just a few quick notes here. It's very easy to get way off topic on this, where we just get buried in other passages and all that. Um, notice just that they are not being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So this is not Holy Spirit baptism, as I referred to earlier. We're not going down that road at this point, at least, um, as I understand it. Holy Spirit baptism happened twice to the 12 apostles themselves at the beginning of Acts 2, and then also, as I said earlier, to Cornelius and his household, actually before they were baptized, with the baptism that we're talking about here in Acts chapter 10. Uh, to be baptized in the Spirit was to be baptized by the Spirit, overwhelmed, plunged beneath the Spirit, uh, in a sense. So something the Spirit did to a person. Uh, but the kind of baptism we have here in Acts chapter 2 is not that. This is administered by human beings to other human beings, an actual immersion in water. Some have suggested that the gift of the Spirit in this passage is simply the Word of God. When we are baptized, we receive the Word of God. That is the gift of the Spirit. But I would just point out something interesting, and that is, notice down in verse 41, that those who had received His Word were baptized. So notice, they received the Word of God before baptism, not afterwards. And so, receiving the gift of the Spirit is apparently something other than receiving the Word of God. Uh, some have suggested that Peter is referring to the ability to perform miracles with this reference to the Spirit. Um, however, we'll get to this a little bit later over in Acts chapter 8, and we could combine some other passages together. We find that the ability to perform miracles is not given automatically at the point of baptism, but rather it is only given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Um, an apostle had to be there to lay his hands on you for that to happen. And so this does not also, this does not seem to be a reference to miraculous ability. And so as I understand it then, it's not the word of God. It's not the ability to perform miracles. But somehow the spirit is given to us at the point of baptism. There's no indication we can feel it. That's not what's going on here. 
There's no indication that the Spirit gives us any kind of special power, but in some sense, we are given the Spirit at the point of baptism. And I think we all have to agree to that. We have to see that in this verse. At some, in some way, uh, we're given the gift of the Spirit uh, in, at the point of baptism. And for now, I would just leave it at that. Our focus is baptism in this passage. According to Peter, when he commands baptism, he says that it is to be done for the forgiveness of sins, and it results in receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in studying with an outsider who's just starting to understand some of these things, I would just explain both of these are good things, right? These are good things, not bad things. And we want to obey the command here. We want the promises uh, that are promised in this passage. Uh, also, in the other column, I would just briefly point out that all people can be saved. Peter says that this promise, this statement that he makes in verse 38, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So what he says here is in force from that moment until the Lord returns, until the end of time. This is a reference to us. Acts 2.38 applies to us. This is not limited uh, to those who heard it for the first time. So again, in the blanks, I would just indicate those who are baptized need to be old enough to feel guilt and repent. Uh, they are baptized the same day that they hear and understand the word of God. They are baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, it is essential to salvation. It results in receiving the gift of the Spirit. And the promise is for all people from here on out until the end of time. We come to the next reference to baptism in Acts chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. So the gospel is now spreading north to Samaria, up north of Jerusalem. Notice, please, Acts 8, 12 and 13. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. As he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Well, as to the age, those who were baptized, they're old enough to believe, aren't they? They heard Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they understood that. These are not little babies. Uh, they were adults. They responded to that message by being baptized. And so they were old enough to believe, and they're even described here as being men and women. These are not little children. Uh, we have nothing concerning the action as to when they're baptized. It just says when they believed. And so they believe and they're baptized. There's no indication of a pause or a delay in between their belief and their baptism. As to the purpose, we don't really have anything here. Uh, under other, I would probably note that baptism followed the preaching of the good news. Philip preaches about Jesus and his kingdom, and then people are baptized in response uh, to that message. So on our sheet, I would just note that the Samaritans are old enough to believe. They're men and women. Uh, they are baptized when they believe, and they're baptized in response to Philip's preaching of the good news. Well, that seems like a pretty good place for us to pause tonight. Hopefully, when we come back together next week, we can continue looking at the passages on baptism. Uh, if you have any questions up to this point, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, please get in touch. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us your word. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you for making forgiveness possible. We're thankful for the sacrifices that have been made down through the years to be able to read your word in our own language. And tonight we're especially thankful for your plan as described for us in the Bible. Tonight we also ask for continued healing for those who are suffering with the virus. We're thankful for the good news that we've had this week concerning a vaccine. We pray that we as your people might be willing and able to help and to encourage all of those who are not able to get out. And we pray that we might be willing to do good and to share. Bless our college students as they wrap up this semester and be with them as they travel home. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Master. Lord, come quickly. Amen.